Well, good morning and happy Easter. You know, for, for the Christian, uh, this Sunday is like our, uh, it's like our Super Bowl. Uh, I, I mean, I know it may not feel like it, you know, because we're not all together in the way that we're normally together, you know, and the, the room is filled with people on, on Easter Sunday morning. But the truth is, look, whether we're together or not, the message and truth of Easter doesn't change. This is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. This is the day that we we take time to focus on the central truth around which our entire belief system is built, that Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, and rose again on the third day, just as the scripture said he would. So listen, folks, whether it, it feels like it or not, this is a big deal and we need to celebrate. So right where you're at, whether you're by yourself or whether you're with your family or, you know, a few, you know, you know people you live with and so on, I want, I, th- I think we should do something. It may feel a little awkward, but let's just shout it out. Thank God for Easter. Okay, can we do it? Thank God for Easter. <laughs> Thank God for the resurrection. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, this morning we want to conclude our our, uh, our series talking about the I am sayings of Jesus. And this morning we're, we're, we're looking at this great statement of Jesus where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever believes and lives and believes in me will never die. Now, this is such an incredible statement for Jesus to make at any time. But it's such an incredible, even more incredible, when you think that Jesus makes this statement at a moment of crisis, at the funeral of some, somebody that people loved. And, and I think that makes it even more poignant for us as we're in the midst of a, of a world crisis right now. The occasion that Jesus makes a statement is, is the funeral of Lazarus, who is the brother of Mary and Martha. Now, if you've got your Bible there, you might want to turn to the passage there in, in uh, John chapter 11. That's where the story is found. And, uh, and early in the chapter, you're going to discover that uh, it describes Jesus' relationship with Lazarus. It says, Lazarus was someone whom Jesus loved. Now, that is uh, when, when the gospel writers use that term, someone who Jesus loved, it's, it's usually reserved for uh, those who were closest to Jesus, like his disciples. So when it talks about you know, Lazarus and Mary and Martha as someone who Jesus loved, I, I, you need to know these people were really close to Jesus. These people were, were like family. Jesus cared a lot about these people. And uh, John 11 opens with these words. Now, the man Lazarus was sick. And so his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, you can, almost, um, you can almost hear the sense of urgency in their voice. It's like, Lord, uh, our brother Lazarus, the one whom you love is sick. Uh, you need to get here now or else, you know, it's going to be too late. Now, usually, like when Jesus got word that someone was sick, he would, he would respond immediately. In fact, we see from, you know, uh, the stories in the gospel, sometimes he would change his plans just to make sure that, that he got there as quick as possible. But not this time. In fact, it says that when he hears that his good friend Lazarus is sick, he is in no hurry to get there. And and of course, he he does this on purpose, doesn't he, right? He knows that by delaying his arrival, that in fact, Lazarus is going to die. Now, look, Jesus is not heartless. You know, he's not callous. On the contrary, he has something to accomplish that he can only accomplish if Lazarus is dead. In fact, he says to his disciples in verse 14, he says, uh, he said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. In other words, he's saying to his disciples, if if I were there, I could have healed him, but I chose not to go. I actually chose to let him die because I have something greater in mind. And you just watch what's going to happen. Now, of course, eventually they do go. And when Jesus finally arrives at the home of of Mary and Martha, everyone now is in mourning because Lazarus is dead and he's been dead for a few days and his body is already in the tomb. And of course, what Jesus does next 
is like one of the most famous incidents in history, one of the most famous, well-known uh, stories in the entire Bible. And it is also very revealing about to show us who Jesus really is. And that's what I really want to see today, who Jesus is. And through this encounter, how Jesus reveals who he is. Because how we see Jesus will affect how we view everything else in the rest of our life. So let's pick up the story of John chapter 11, verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two and a half miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were in her house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how much he loved him. And so Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. And of course, his sisters are obviously heartbroken over this. I mean, they love their brother and now he's dead. And we see that they are grieving each in their own way. Now, how many know that different people grieve differently, right? In different ways. Some people are very outward and emotional with their grief, and that's okay. Other people are, are more inward with their grief, and that's okay as well. You know, it, it often depends on the situation, if, you know, whether it's someone who's young has died, or whether it's a tragedy, or whether somebody's old, or, or maybe even just it relates to the person's temperament. Different people grieve differently. It's just like how different people, you know, relate differently to this crisis, this pandemic that we're in. You know, I mean, some people are, are, are just incredibly concerned that everyone would be protected, and, and that they're concerned that nobody should ever go out or anything without a mask. Other people, on the other hand, they they don't seem to care as much. And most people, I think, are somewhere in between. But my, my point is this. Different people respond differently in a crisis. And it's the same way with how people grieve. And so these two sisters are each grieving in their own way. Now, the, the main thing I want you to see in this story is actually the different ways in which Jesus responds to the sister's moment of grief. Because how Jesus responds to these two sisters reveals something very interesting about who Jesus is and how he wants us to see him. The first sister, Martha, she comes to Jesus and says, look, Lord, Lord if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then moments later, her sister Mary comes out and, and says the same thing, like verbatim. Lord, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And, and so what you have here is two sisters facing the very same situation, using the exact same words. But when you look at Jesus' response to the sisters, he responds completely differently. For instance, when Martha speaks to Jesus, his response, he almost argues with her. <laughs> I mean, her message is Jesus. You came too late. And what is Jesus' response? It's boldly, I am the resurrection and the life. Come on, Martha. I I'm God. Don't you know who I am? I am never too late. 
You know, it's, it's interesting what Jesus does with Martha. I mean, Jesus, he knows all things. He knows what Martha is going through. And, and, and he can see what's in her heart. And, 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 I, and I believe that he actually looks at Martha and sees that the flow of her heart is almost moving toward despair and doubt. Like, Jesus, you came too late. All hope is lost. Notice what Jesus does here. Jesus, in this moment, actually pushes against that flow toward despair. And in that moment, he actually rebukes her doubt. And in its place, he speaks truth. (laughs) And what is the truth? Well, it's the greatest truth of all. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me, who lives and believes in me, shall never die. What an amazing truth this is. You know, it's it's, it's interesting, just as as an aside here, that, that, that Jesus does not say that people who believe in him will never die physically. He he doesn't say that because we all die. You know, I heard a a preacher recently put it like this. He says, you know, life life is like a runway. He says, you know, some people's runway is short. Other people's runway is longer. But eventually we all come to the end of our runway. In other words, eventually we all die. And then he said something very, very interesting. He said, you know, if we view life simply through the lens of the runway, if we view life simply through the lens of this world and all that just happens simply in this world, then when we come to the end of our runway or somebody comes, then it seems like that death is so tragic. But he went on, if we look at life through the lens of the resurrected Christ, And what he has promised about life eternal and life after death, then we can have hope. And I think that's what Jesus is doing with Martha. He's replacing her despair with truth, the kind of truth that brings hope. He reminds her that because he is the resurrection and the life, she can have hope. That's how he deals with Martha. Now with Mary, notice his response is completely different. Again, Mary says the same thing, doesn't she? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But this time, Jesus' response is completely opposite. He doesn't argue. In fact, he's practically speechless. And instead of pushing against the flow of her heart's sadness, in that moment, he enters into her sadness. Verse 33 says, when Jesus saw her weeping, And the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how much he loved him. Martha comes to Jesus with despair. And he responds with truth. Mary comes to him with grief. And he responds with tears. Exact same question. Two completely different responses. Very, very interesting. I like what um, Dr. Timothy Keller uh, has to say about this. Uh, Listen carefully. He says, you know, imagine you were making up a story about a divine figure who who had come to earth in disguise as a human being. So you're writing the story about this, right? And in the story... This divine being arrives at a funeral of a friend, knowing that he has the power to raise his dead friend to life and that he's about to wipe away all the mourner's tears in the space of just a few minutes. What would be this person's most likely inner emotional state? Surely you as the writer would depict him as smiling, excited, even playful. You, you'd expect him to be rubbing his hands with anticipation, saying under his breath, wait, wait until you see what I'm about to do. It's going to be awesome. Or perhaps you as the storyteller, you know, would just keep him speaking throughout the, the event in an elevated tone, saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Both of these reactions, Keller writes, would would seem to be in character for someone who claims to be divine. But we would never imagine that such a divine person would suddenly get sucked up into Mary's agony and just stand there weeping. 
Why would he be so strong one minute and so vulnerable the next? That's a good question. And I think perhaps the answer to that question is found in the fact that Jesus is trying to teach us something about himself. And it's this. He's trying to teach us that he is both fully God and fully man at the same time. You see, Jesus was not just God disguised as a man. And he, he, he was not just a man with the air, air of deity. No, no, no. He's both God and both man wrapped up into one. And John, who's retelling this story, he doesn't want us to miss this. In fact, this idea of, uh, of being both God and man is very important to John. And he, he highlights this throughout his gospel. Did you remember how John begins his gospel? Right in the very first chapter. In the beginning was the word, talking about Jesus. And the word Jesus was with God. And the word Jesus was God. And the word Jesus became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and full of truth. And all throughout his gospel, John wants us to know that, look, at Jesus is not just simply a good teacher or a nice prophet. No, no, no. For John, it's so much more than that. Jesus is God incarnate. He is God coming to earth, walking in human flesh. He wants us to see Jesus as the God man, but he also wants us to see Jesus as one who is full of truth and full of grace. And those are the two ideas that John wants us to clearly see in this story of Mary and Martha. And these are the two ideas that come through so clearly in Jesus' different responses to that same question that they pose. Lord, Lord, if you'd been here, our brother would not have died. See, to Martha, he responds in the way that he does to show her the truth about the fact that Jesus is divine, that he's God, that he's never late, that he's always on time. He wants to remind her that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the great I am. And so he responds to her in that way to show that he's divine. Now to Mary, he responds the way he does. Not just to offer her truth, but to offer her grace and to remind her, look, not only am I divine, but Mary, I'm also human. I weep with those who weep. And so to Mar Martha, he offers truth. And to Mary, he offers tears. And the reason Jesus responds so differently to the same question is to allow us to see both sides of himself. That he, at the same time, is both God and man. And folks, this is so important for us to see. Because you know what? Sometimes in our life, we need to see him more as God, son of God. And sometimes in our life, we need to see him more as the son of man. Sometimes we need to know that he is God. And because he's God, there's no miracle that is too great for him to perform. Other times we need to know that not only is he powerful, but he's also caring. Sometimes we just need Jesus to come and put his arms around us just like he did with Mary and cry with us. There's times we need to know the truth and there's times we need to feel the grace. And the wonderful thing about it is, <laughs> here's the great thing, no matter what you need, with Jesus, you get both. You get both God and man, grace and truth. And so let me ask you today, what do you need from Jesus? Do you need a miracle? Are you like Martha who said, Lord, if only you would have been here, my brother would have died. God, if only you'd have shown up just a little sooner, this thing that I'm facing wouldn't have happened. Like Martha, do you need Jesus to say to you, I am the resurrection and the life. I am God. And if I'm God, I'm never too late. Trust me. Like Martha, do you need to respond to the truth that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you need to respond to the truth that Jesus is the only one who can answer the question of where you will spend eternity? Oh, if that's you today, if that's you, I encourage you, open up your heart to him. Embrace his love for you. Reach out, surrender your heart. Give your heart fully to him today. 
Or today, maybe you're more like Mary, and you just need somebody to come alongside and grieve with you. Maybe in the midst of this crisis that we're facing, you're at your wit's end, and you need Jesus just to come and wrap his arms around you and weep with you. Boy, if that's you today, I want, I want you to know Jesus is here for you. Jesus cares. Let him in. Let him embrace you. Let him love you. And let him help you to get through this difficult time. Well, the story doesn't end there, does it? Thankfully, it doesn't. <laughs> and so it says, after he weeps with Mary, Jesus says, where have you laid him? Where, where have you laid Lazarus? And it says, they took him to the tomb where Lazarus was laying. And it says, when Jesus came to the tomb, he was deeply moved. Now, people who study the language of the time would say that the best way to translate that, that phrase, deeply moved, is, is more than just Jesus was distressed. No, no, it implies anger and even some rage. You see, Jesus, as, as, as Jesus comes to the tomb, again, don't miss this, we, we, we see once again both his divinity and his humanity coming together. See, as he, as he looks at the tomb, I can only feel and imagine that he is reminded of his own impending death that would come in just a few days. He knows that that he would die on the cross, but he also knows that, that like Lazarus, he would be raised from the dead. But he knows that before he could be raised from the dead, that he would have to endure the most painful, excruciating death known to man, the death on a cross. And so as God, he knows that there's no other way. But as man, he knows it's not going to be easy. And so when he comes to the tomb, it says he's deeply moved. He, he is angry at sin. He is angry at the devil. He is enraged that it's had to come to this. But he doesn't let that stop him from doing what he's come to earth to accomplish. And so as this incredible sign of what was going to be to come in just a few days, Jesus tells them to roll away the stone. And then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And in verse 44, it says the dead man came out. And Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. <laughs> Boy, can you imagine what it must have been like to be there to see a dead man walking out of a tomb? Can you imagine what it must have been like for, for Mary and Martha? Can you imagine the joy and adulation they must have felt that moment as they stood beside Jesus and welcomed their brother who is dead back to life again? It must have been amazing. Oh, friends, in closing, let me just remind you of some things that you probably already know, and it's this. That same Jesus who spoke to Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> that same Jesus who, who took time to pause and, and weep with Mary. That same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead and gave him back to his sisters again. That same Jesus who went to the cross in our place and suffered the pain and sorrow as the son of man. That same Jesus who rose on the third day, defeating death and the devil as the son of God. That same Jesus who did all this and so much more is the same Jesus who is present with you at this very moment. Hallelujah. What do you need from Jesus today? Do you need a miracle? Do you need God to work some kind of a, a miraculous thing in your life? Do you need to experience the new birth that is found by surrendering our heart to Jesus? Do you need somebody to come and give you words of comfort and encouragement today? Listen, that same Jesus who was with Mary and Martha so many years ago is the same Jesus who's with you right now, right where you're watching this. So I would encourage you, reach out. Embrace him and give him your heart and give him your soul and let him know that you know that he is in control. Let him love on you today. You bow with me in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for the resurrection. I thank you that you're not some dead Messiah whose body's rotting away in the grave, but you are the Lord who is alive. Thank you that you are the resurrected Christ that has come to bring life everlasting. Thank you for the assurance that the resurrection brings to people that death is not the end, 
that there is more, that there is life everlasting, that there is light that comes after the darkness. Thank you for that assurance. Lord, I pray for those who need a message of hope today. I pray in particular, Lord, for those who need to surrender their lives to you today. Lord, that's where hope is found in giving our life over to Jesus. I think of my friend Rob, who so many years ago surrendered his life on an Easter Sunday, and and he said, that's the best decision I ever made. Oh God, I pray for those who need to make that same decision today. May they, in this very moment, open up their heart to you and say, yes, Jesus, on this Easter Sunday, I give my heart, I give my life, I give everything to you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I also pray for those who this morning have been battling with grief and loss. They feel like in in the midst of this crisis we're facing, they've lost something. And and God, they may even feel afraid. They may even not be sure about where the future holds. Oh God, may you come to them in this moment and embrace them in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their fear. May you replace their fear with faith. And give them the assurance that you are in control. Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for dying and rising from the dead. When you died, it seemed like all hope was lost. But when you rose again, you proved once and for all, hope is alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. The worship team's got one more song that that they're going to sing for us. And and I just encourage you to to enter right into the song. It's a great song. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Go and enjoy the rest of your Easter. God bless you.